As important as religion is to our personal lives and our lives in the world, it's remarkable that the coverage of it by the media has been so spotty. Peggy Waymeyer was an exception when she was hired first at Channel 8 and then at ABC News. She'll be our guest to talk more about that on Good God. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm George Mason, your host, and I'm pleased to welcome to the program today, Peggy Waymeyer. Peggy, glad to have you with us. Nice to be here, George. Peggy is a uh, career journalist who has spent most of her career covering religion, and she is a freelance writer now, uh, but her story is one that um, uh, is almost impossible to tell without uh, talking about the religious life of Dallas for the past three decades or so, uh, not to mention um, religion coverage nationally. So, uh, Peggy, let's just begin with the fact that uh, when, when I first came here, uh, I was watching you on Channel 8 News and you were covering uh, religion for WFAA. And then uh, a, a big moment happened when uh, Peter Jennings called and you went to uh, ABC News, News uh, and began to cover religion nationally. Uh, how did you first break into uh, religious news reporting uh, on uh, Channel 8? Well, that's a, that's a fun and long story, George. I, I was actually in seminary. I had been a journalism major mm -hmm. at the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even a Christian. I didn't grow up in the church, and I would walk by. Those, those of you who went to UT know that there's a big tower, and it says, "Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And every day, going to class, I'd walk by that, and I thought, you know, what? A, you shall know the truth. I mean, college, I'm going to find mm -hmm. the truth. And it uh, turns out, of course, Jesus said those words. And my sophomore year, I was introduced by a campus group to the Christian faith, and I thought, this is crazy, this is extraordinary, this is kind of radical, very different than anything I had been taught growing up. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Barbados and Mexico and Oklahoma and Ohio and Florida and Houston. A, a very homogeneous background yes, growing yes. up I in all those little, communities, right? I had been all over the place. Yes, uh -huh. okay. My, my mother was actually a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany. Right. My father was a sometimes practicing Christian scientist, but wow. mostly an Ayn Rand follower. So I, we we, we'll get into that we in a, in a little goers. later. But so yes. I had nothing. I came kind of with a, with a blank slate into faith. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I dove into this in college when you're mm -hmm. exploring all kinds of things while I was studying. And about the same time that I stumbled into a journalism class and all the lights went on, like, oh my gosh, this minimizes my weaknesses and maximizes my strengths. Okay. I stumbled into Jesus. So my faith started developing at the same time I started studying journalism, worked for the paper uh, at the University of Texas, which is a big campus newspaper. And I remember the first big story I had was on, back then, it was in the 70s, uh, Sun Young Moon and the, these- right. Unification <laughs> Church, unifi yes. They, they'd come to campus and recruiting people and it was a big expose and, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, it was quite a rush, like wow, when you report on religion and things that carry weight and meaning in terms of the direction of people's lives, you get a big response. Right. I got such a big response to that one that I had to leave town because I got death threats. Really? Yeah. I remember going yeah. home to my parents thinking, wow. whoa, wow, I'm going to do some more reporting. <laughs> and so yeah. I, as I became more stirred by the impact of faith in people's lives, right. I uh, decided I wanted to cover these things. But first I needed to go to seminary, I thought. So I came to Dallas against my parents' wishes. They wanted me to go into business. Went to seminary, and about that time, I, um, again, m m I, I can never tell young people, here's how you do it from my life, because I didn't do it that way. Right. I kind of stumbled into the number one TV station in Dallas right. uh, through uh, my, a, a friendship I had with one of the anchor men who was working, doing pro bono work at the seminary. Mm -hmm. And I got my first job. like. Uh, writing copy and tearing scripts, and mm. I kept telling the news director and your friend Dave Lane, right, the right, general who was a manager, member here of our church, who was a member here, the right. general manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I said you guys are missing all these great stories out there on religion. Yes. Right, and so they started passing out my story ideas to senior reporters, and they'd go. The reporters would go, which uh, unfortunately reporters all over still go. 
I don't get this at all. I this right. is not my language. I'm not covering this. Right. So I'd keep going into the news director's office mm -hmm. saying, "Let me, let me." And one day I read in the Dallas Morning News that they had hired me as the first religion reporter in local TV. Right. So I started covering you, religion you in read Dallas. That. Yes. That's I right. learned that way because I kept begging, "Let me do it. That's I funny. can cover these stories." So, so you started covering stories in Dallas, and and that was sort of an innovation in the news business. Yeah. Where it was where a first. It was a first. Sadly. Yes, and uh, and it, it didn't last for very long because there are forces at work, uh, both economic and ideological, that make it difficult to uh, to, to cover religion. Uh, but before before that change, there was a, a really important step up where Peter Jennings called, yeah, uh, and 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 he had his own same sense somewhat as you did, that the, this was an underreported aspect of yeah. American culture. Yeah, he had been reporting in the Middle East for a long time. Remember right. those? Uh, remember yes. watching him on the air with those trench coats right, right. in Lebanon or Beirut right. or right. Uh, Jerusalem, and he, he saw from his reporting right. how much religion shaped the world. Right. And he came back to New York when he came to the mm -hmm. New York office and said, why aren't we covering religion? And he. He agitated the management at ABC News for, he says, three years to hire a religion reporter. And they were like, finally, they said, you want a religion reporter? You go find one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he did. And, and fortunately for me, I was the only one in the country. Right. <laughs> so he called one day. Yeah. And you know, whether you're talking about the Middle East or you're talking about America, you mentioned Dave Lane. I remember very vividly the, uh, the Sunday afternoon that Dave Lane called me uh, when uh, David Koresh and his uh, cult outside of Waco when that um, oh, yeah. conflagration, conflagration happened and, and, and Dave, you know, uh, said, how do we cover this, you know, and, um, and, and I, was, I was talking to Bob Mung recently about this as well. Uh, the, the, the problem is that so many of these um, stories have a, a religious, a, a definite religious angle to them and they wouldn't be understandable apart from the religious dimension to it. It's not just that we cover the Methodists meeting in general conference to try to decide what they're gonna do with LGBTQ members. Uh, it, it, it's not just the Southern Baptist s s struggles of where we're just covering religion per se. It's also the everyday stories that if you don't know the religious ideology uh, underpinning uh, all of this, you really can't cover the whole story, can you? That is a very profound thing that you just said that most people don't understand. Oh. And, uh, and you just raised a great story. Mm -hmm. When the David Koresh story happened mm -hmm. right. outside uh, Waco, mm -hmm. I, I went, to, we all took shifts as mm -hmm. reporters, and I went down for an overnight shift. And I remember we were all like camped out, we had news trucks. And there they were in this compound, David Koresh, with all his people believing it was the end of the world. He was the Messiah. He was going to save them. And the FBI came in. The government was in. Right. And at night, you could hear them with loudspeakers screaming, crying babies, like intimidating him, doing these terrible things. And I remember I was the only reporter, because I understood religion, saying, right. you're feeding this their is exactly very apocalyptic what it was. beliefs. You are telling all his followers that you are the dangerous government that's ushering in the end of the world. St Stop it. Stop I, it. Nobody Don't understood that. No. The government didn't understand right. it. The media didn't understand right. it. It's not, right. I'm not trying to brag here, but I remember sitting there as a young reporter going, what are you thinking? That's precisely the point. That's your point. That's precisely the point. And I've seen it over and over. Yeah. Listen, when the airplanes mm -hmm. flew into 9-11, yes. into those towers, mm -hmm. and I remember watching Diane Sawyer and others who I admire saying, Oh my gosh, these people are insane. They're crazy. They'd show how they, can you believe they prayed ahead of time? Right. Can you believe they think they're going to some other life if they do? Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, yes, yes I, I can, can believe, believe that. that. Right, right. We understand them. Right, right. So I, it, it, yeah. it's so yeah. frustrating to me that the media still has failed. The people in charge who make the decisions, what mm -hmm. airs, what doesn't, right. do not get mm -hmm. the, the core meaning of faith and religion in people's lives. How it Well, and I think we should be clear that just because we understand that they prayed and thought they were going to heaven for what they did doesn't mean 
we, uh, in understanding them, that we agree with them or oh, that we think not. that that but worldview is something martyrs. to be do. But Christians martyr themselves. Christians martyr themselves. Yeah. Muslims martyr themselves. Yes, yes. Buddhists martyr themselves. Yes. So we, this, so this that is not we understand. A, we do understand not this sort of thing. They're mentally ill necessarily. Well, they, they may have, have been. They, they are. They, there is a reasonableness within the the system yes. of their worldview. Yes. But it may not be. It may not be rational in a larger uh, right. sense, right. but within. Within the worldview that they've adopted, it makes perfect sense. Of course, it's it part of what we're talking about. Yeah, and many of mm -hmm. us who share religion that calls for devout um, adherence to yes. your belief, right? Hopefully, the one you're following is uh, not calling you to fly airplanes into towers. But right. you're right. But it might call you to opt out of certain things. Yes, there are. There is a, a history in our country, for instance, of conscientious objection yes. to war. Yes. Well, a, a, a Christian who decides that uh, he or she is is primarily committed to a vision of peace, say, uh, and nonviolence, might seem un-American if choosing not, you know, to to fight for the nation in the way that otherwise. But then we have now. We're adjudicating so many different issues with regard to uh, contraception through insurance companies, uh, whether yes. uh, it, these things are provided or mandated by government and these kinds of things. Uh, you know, how, uh, whether because gay marriage is legal, uh, what requirements are there of, uh, of clergy now? Do they, you know, that they act as agents of the state, and then what if they choose not to? Are they in a discriminatory position? So there's all sorts of things that we're wrestling with uh, in in these matters. Uh, so understanding the logic from within is part of the public service that religion reporters could provide, right? And helping people, you know, George. I think the greatest one of my guiding hopes and goals when I was a religion reporter mm -hmm. was to create understanding and compassion mm -hmm. for whatever side. You know, instead of, in news we have a short amount of time and there's usually a protagonist and an antagonist and everybody right. likes that, right. Right? right? In religion this is very dangerous. Yes. So I had to navigate this road of making a story sexy with a protagonist, antagonist, a battle, a conflict, whether right. it's you know, church, state issues or whatever, you had to elevate the battle. Mm -hmm. But I would try to find characters who you could, when you heard them, or when I picked which sound bites I would use, right. the best compliment I would get is when I would come back up to the newsroom in New York and a very, very non-religious reporter who, who would be brilliant and I would spec would come up to me and go, and this happened often, that's the first time I've ever understood why someone would do that. Right. I never understood that. Right. And that was my goal. Right. Let's just, let's not me try to tell people what they should think and believe. Let's not me try to slip in my religious beliefs to convince the public that this side is better than this. Let's, let's open, put some light on both sides so we can have compassion for both. Okay, but, but what you're saying, Peggy, is that what you were trying to do in what's become known as the mainstream media is to drive us toward the center. Uh, when so many forces are pushing us toward the edges. So we, we like to talk on this program about the common good and part of the public service that a religion reporter uh, like you was providing and can provide for us is to see the truth in our neighbor that we otherwise would not be able to see. And, right. and you know, George, I love the way you just said that. Yeah. The truth in your neighbor. Mm -hmm. If your neighbor is a young couple mm -hmm. who are homeschooling their children mm -hmm. and have had a dream of starting a little bakery that honors God mm -hmm. and promised God they would never bake a cake for a gay wedding mm -hmm. and they refuse to do it mm -hmm. and they're considered right-wing, bigoted, fanatical, part of hate crime groups because mm -hmm. of it, and they lose their jobs, mm -hmm. and their kids are ostracized. I want people to be able to, whoa, back up and go, why would that? 
can I have any empathy for this couple? Right, right. Are they crazy? Are they mean? Right. Are they part of the Ku Klux Klan? No. Right. So I don't even know if it's coming in the middle, but I like what you said. Um, I'm, when I let's, let's hold that thought okay, right okay. there because we need to take a break. All right. But I want to come back and I want to pursue this more because we have – uh, we are in a moment, I think, when we're wrestling with what's the line between the deference to religious liberty and the place at which that crosses over into the feeling of, of discrimination. Uh, that's a, a public challenge as well. So uh, when we come back, we'll, we'll talk about that. Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square is a broad and diverse coalition of Dallas's faith leaders dedicated to service, hope, and a shared vision for North Texas. Faith Forward Dallas creates and supports a community of respect and compassion for all, sharing in the mission of the Thanksgiving Foundation to heal divisions and enhance mutual understanding. We're back with Peggy Waymeyer. Uh, freelance writer and religion reporter for more than three decades and we were talking about this deference that we should learn to show to people of strong religious convictions because uh, the nature of our country is that religious liberty should be a, uh, accorded to all and, um, and, and in fact I, re I remember um, the late Jeff Weiss, you know, uh, who used to write for the Morning News, Jeff, Jeff used to say something to the effect of everyone's religion looks crazy to someone from the outside, but sane to someone from the inside. Uh, and so we find ourselves in this situation at times where uh, people in the general public feel that granting such liberty to people uh, to feel like they're discriminating against others is is crossing the line and and sort of missing the mark of what religious liberty is supposed to be. Uh, what are some ways you've wrestled with that? In other words, you, you mentioned the cake baking uh, for a gay marriage. That was certainly one of those uh, one of those cases. But we also have people who uh, we have bills on um, that have been filed in Austin right now. Uh, to give healthcare professionals the right of opting out of treating people uh, because of their own personal religious objections. And so we have all sorts of things we're wrestling with uh, about this. What kinds of thoughts do you have, Peggy, as you've uh, covered well, this over time? You know, I haven't been covering, covering those issues in the last decade when they've become so politicized right. and controversial. So I'd, you'd have to give me case by case. Mm -hmm. I do have empathy for the bakers. Mm. Now, I may not agree with them. Mm. I, I may not agree with them, but I do understand them. Right. Um, and I think, uh, I think the, I can speak from how I feel the media deal. I think the media is a little unbalanced in how they deal with these people. For mm -hmm. example, I recent saw, recently saw a story about uh, the vice president's wife, Karen Pence. You're probably familiar with this. Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying whether I'm for or like or don't like mm -hmm. Mike Pence. But his wife teaches in a uh, traditional Christian evangelical elementary school where they sign a little covenant that schools have signed forever mm -hmm. and people have believed in for millennia mm -hmm. that says, we believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. The media went nuts. Like, oh my God, she's dangerous. He's dangerous. Mm -hmm. He shouldn't be vice president. And I read that and I thought, really? Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a right to teach in a school that's been around forever, that mm -hmm. people have been teaching in forever, just because now we've decided mm -hmm. she's part of a hate group mm -hmm. because she believes marriage is between a man and a woman. I think that's over the top. Right. Now, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on legal issues. If it becomes a, a, a crime, to have a, um, well, that's what I worry about. I do worry. When does it become criminal to have a belief you think that people have followed for years and years and years that is no longer acceptable? Well, I, I agree that that's certainly true, but you also have to recognize, I think, and would, that you know, if we were talking about racism as something that we, uh, and you know, separate but equal, or whatever the case may be, that was something people agreed for 
you know, that's, hundreds yeah, and I hundreds think of years. Yeah, that's very different, and that's it, the case we always use. You're right. Well, well it is, and, yeah. and similarly, we, we, we'd like to talk more uh, in a later segment about uh, patriarchy is another situation yeah. and the, you know, the role of women in society and those sorts of things. So, you know, I think part of the, re the thing we wrestle with is, yes, there's, there's Karen Pence and her teaching in, in a school, but there's also the, the question of when Mike Pence was the governor of Indiana and, uh, and, and the anti-LGBT legislation that he promoted. So you, you have a secular environment there and so I think they're, they're matching up the private and the public and saying this is all of one cloth, where I think part of the argument that, that we should be making is that there, there, there is a tradition of uh, privileging private schools and, uh, and, and religion to function in spheres that, are, um, that should be deferred to uh, in, in terms yeah. of the way they function and their values. And, and that's a long history of, of First Amendment privileges and rights in this country. And when those get attacked, whether from the left or the right, uh, then we, we have to defend them. So, right, yeah. and those are the things I notice. It's like, uh, it takes me back to the Bill Clinton era with RIFRA. Yes. I mean, that, that, uh, uh, we the religious the freedom that. That restoration was a, yeah, yeah, I'm right. sorry, that was yeah. a big story, but the media was like, ah, big deal, big deal, big deal. Right, that, that's that was a, a huge big story. story. And hardly Absolutely. anyone covered it in, right. in, in a significant way. Right. And, and that's what you're referring to. Well, well it is. And, you know, back in those days, we were dealing with questions of whether, yeah. uh, you know, Native Americans should be allowed to smoke uh, right. a peyote, exactly. right? You know, and uh, these sorts of things. And whether Jehovah's Witnesses should be able right. to opt out of uh, blood transfusions and things. Now it's much more personal in a more mainstream way in a lot of these uh, questions about um, abortion partly and and, and I was then, just thinking abor abortions yeah. another yeah. you know so I was starting to report George as you know in the 80s you were pastor here mm -hmm. and abortion and gay rights were the two hot issues right nothing changes nothing changes it it's seems. still mm -hmm. abortion and gay rights right. I guess religious liberty is bigger now mm -hmm. than it was in the 80s well but That's I think religious I think the religious liberty issues are about abortion and, and gay rights partly yes Mar they're mostly. linked to that often. they they really are you yes know? they are so, um, yeah do we do you, uh, on the right people would say do we have the right to be, can you know what both sides want I think in a way I had to simplify can we believe what we believe and be valued and respected? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And both sides demonize yeah. the other. And what right. I wanted to do as a reporter was to get rid of the demonization, right. no attitude going into it. Let the viewers, as a Christian reporter, I want to just say this, you know, people would challenge me saying, how can you go to a church and cover religion? Isn't that a conflict of interest? And I'd say, wait a minute, didn't you cover the last political election? Did you vote? Right. I actually think as a Christian, it, may, it equipped me to be a good reporter because I had to trust God. I, to have an agenda, to have a bias, which we all have some unconscious bias, but to right. have a conscious bias or an agenda as a reporter would have been sin for me. Mm -hmm. My highest calling as a journalist mm -hmm. was to trust God with the information I have and give it to the viewers in the best way that I could and leave it there, yeah. not to spin things. Right. And I was consistently pressured in some ways, spin it, have an edge, have an attitude. Mm. This is what we believe. This is what we believe, Yeah. meaning the media. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So we, we have to win this battle. You know, and the, the New York Times now, as much as I love that, ma uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. that newspaper, mm -hmm. they have become so much more, uh, not, I don't wanna say just like Fox News, which has become a mouthpiece for political right wing, but, right. The, but the New York Times, has more of an agenda than I've ever seen them have. Mm -hmm. In some areas, you have to know how to read it, like which things are agenda driven. You know, they're, right. the media is so desperate right now. Mm -hmm. Some media outlets are trying to save the country right. in the best way they know how, right. which means they're no longer neutral. Mm -hmm. We have to stay neutral. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to figure out the right language for the media, isn't it? Because objectivity was never really um, realistic. And so we use language I, I like fairness. I would argue with you on that. Well, what about fairness? Well, of course, that, but that's uh, what Fox News uses. Well, <laughs> all right, but but fair, fair, fair. I think object, consciously objective. Okay, so 
let's talk about objectivity. No one is totally objective. Uh, exactly. Right. But you have to remove conscious. You're, you can't have a conscious, non-objective point of view right. and report honestly. Right. So I acknowledged, for example, let me give you a perfect example. One of my, well, I had to do street reporting, meaning whatever the police radios called out, I had to do. So we had to go cover a terrible wreck. It was here in South Dallas. A, a, a teenage African-American boy rammed into the back of a young mother with a child in the car. They were in the seat belts. The car burst into flames. The young boy ran from the scene. Uh, we, my photographer and I got there right after it happened. The car's in flames. A gas station attendant across the street sees it, runs into the intersections, trying to cut the kid out of the seat belt. I'm witnessing this whole thing. The, ba the mother dies. The baby's rescued. The kid gets off. Now, I have 90 seconds to tell this story, right. a little 6 o'clock news piece. Depending on my feelings, mm -hmm. and I actually was aware of this, is the story about how dangerous that intersection is and the city needs to change the lights there? Right. Is the story about how bad young African-American gang members are, that they would run away from the scene of a crime and how we need to train young people how not to do this? Is the story about the tragedy of this, the car, uh, Ford Motor Company, whatever, that the car would blow up? Whatever or, or what I about the heroism of the person who's, oh, 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 of you know, course. who's, who's And I think that's actually killing. what I went with. Yeah, right. The positive story. Well. But every reporter, based mm -hmm. on their unconscious bias, right. they might, we might have all the facts of that story in right. 90 seconds, but mm -hmm. what we lead with and what we emphasize mm -hmm. reflects our bias. Right. So that's a bias. But mm -hmm. then when it comes to something like abortion or gay rights mm -hmm. or something like that, if you know your belief is seeping into something, you need to remove yourself from the story. Wow. Without a doubt. Yeah. And that's... You shouldn't cover it. I mean, that's hard to do, removing yourself from stories today. Uh, more and more, it seems like um, we don't know... We don't know what journalism is covering a story because almost everything seems to be done from... A, an point opinion of point of view nowadays. That's not journalism. It, I understand, but right. but but my point is that it's to the general to public, the, yes, it's the line is being blurred, it's especially through and social media. Entertainment and opinion. Right, exactly. Right, and and then you have cable news networks that are much more dedicated to point of view journalism. Well, we should turn them off. Well, we should. No, no, really, people should stop watching cable TV. Mm-hmm. And it, a good citizens must do more work to know what's happening in the world. More work meaning be selective about your news sources, right. be careful what you read, and tune out the ones that are all opinion. What if those opinions, though, make me happy, reinforce my values, make me want to uh, feel like I am... Um, you know, being supported in the world. To me, that's what's really happening with a lot of these cable news networks is people are seeking out those places, not necessarily the places that are giving them news per se in a more objective way, uh, but those places that are simply reinforcing the way they feel. Which means you're choosing if you do that. Yes, it feels good mm -hmm. to have people cheering your tribe on, right. but it means you become more tribal and then right. you contribute to the tribalization of the culture, and you're guilty. Precisely. So yeah. we're back to where we started about finding the truth in your neighbor, which is hard work, which is listening to your work. neighbor. It shouldn't. If well, we start, pra if we've been, pra if we're Christians, yes, and we haven't been practicing this, right. we've missed the whole Christian gospel. Because Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And that doesn't mean agree with your neighbor. Right. That doesn't mean don't confront your neighbor. Right. It means love your neighbor. Right. And we've forgotten how to confront in love, speak the truth in love. There's so much more that we need to talk about, Peggy, but uh, we've got a great start uh, in, in this first uh, time together, and let's continue this in a second episode. I'm so glad we're having this time to, to visit about Me it. Too. Thanks for being on Good God. Yes, thank Good. you, George. Okay. Good.
The picture of homelessness in Dallas, without a doubt, includes children, children with moms and or dads. The problem is clear, but the solution is even clearer. Vogel Alcove invites you to be part of the solution by helping to give back the safety, comfort, and community that homelessness has taken from these children. Your generous gift today starts helping the children at Vogel Alcove tomorrow continue their recovery from the effects of homelessness. What you can give them now is their chance to just be kids.